So talk renewing the pursuit of wisdom. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30. Thus St. Paul begins his first epistle to the Corinthians. How often do you pray for wisdom? How often do you think about it? Odds are not often enough, at least not in a philosophically or theologically robust sense, or even a mystical sense. No offense to any of you, but it's not just not a word we use often uh, as moderns. It's not the way that we think. But then again, some of you went to Catholic institutions, like the one here St. Dominic's, and so you might have studied uh, wisdom a good deal. Most of the years of my life were spent oblivious to the riches of wisdom contained in the, the church's tradition. For those uh, who have received a bachelor's degree, it is likely that you weren't encouraged to think in a necessarily wise manner, especially in the classical sense of the word. When I first realized this, it stopped me dead in my tracks. Modern education, unfortunately, for a host of reasons, has lost a sense of the nobility of pursuing wisdom. With the onset of modernity, there was a shift in how one studied. The ancient and especially medieval vision of a wisely ordered, unified view of reality was largely forgotten, and many modern thinkers looked at knowledge as something simply to be accumulated. With this accumulation, accumulation of knowledge, they thought they could eventually subdue the world to their desires and manipulate it as Francis Bacon sought to do. A, uh, 17th century uh, philosopher. Rene Descartes, known as the father of modern philosophy and a contemporary of Bacon, had this to say, it is possible to reach knowledge that will be of much utility in this life, and instead of the speculative philosophy which is now taught in schools, i.e. scholastic philosophy, we can find a practical one by which knowing the nature and behavior of fire, water, air, stars, the heavens, and all the purposes for which they are suited and so make ourselves masters and possessors of nature. This is desirable not only for the invention of numerable, numerable devices, which would facilitate our enjoyment of the fruits of the earth and all the goods we find there, but also, and most importantly, for the maintenance of health, which is undoubtedly the chief good and the foundation of all the other goods in life. This attitude has been carried directly into our day with a desire by most schools and professions to specialize students in a certain discipline. Many of us receive a paltry dose of a liberal arts education, I know mine was very minimal, um, and then go on to our major and study the things relative, relative, related only to that discipline. We are rarely told, and I'm speaking broadly of American and Catholic education here, of how our first two years of classes are connected with our last two. Even less are we encouraged to integrate all the different components of our college education and high school education into our lives in a proper manner, along with the exercise of virtue and related things. Um, the classical you know, Catholic sense of education was to, to form the entire person. That's what education meant, you know, a bringing out of, a, of the person from, from being kind of a raw child uh, to a, a learned and a ref, a refined, virtuous uh, human being and participant in the church. We have lost the ability to speak fluently about wisdom. People, especially those well-educated, can usually speak about different fields that they're in, but rarely do we speak about the wise ordering of things, especially those of the deeper levels of reality. The more holistic plan of studies I'm sort of hinting at was this, the especially med medieval approach to education in which the university itself was born. I've picked up on this more and more by formation and education as a Dominican because our tradition is greatly influenced by this medieval perspective. It was a much more widespread idea for the ancients and medievals that there was a grand ordering to the world and the cosmos, the cosmos in every facet of reality. This view is pre-Christian, yes, but with the advent of the Christian dispensation, the view of a deeply ordered reality was bolstered as Christian theologians began to base all of this ordering in the eternal wisdom this cosmological worldview and how it pertains to us, our faith, and our spiritual lives, is what I hope to unpack a bit tonight. While many of the ancients and medievals thought this way, I will speak only briefly here about the Christian medieval approach to education and the spiritual life in terms of wisdom, using sacred scripture and St. Thomas Aquinas as my guide. 
So the structure of this presentation will have three basic parts. Um, I'll just kind of define wisdom uh, and its different types, uh, and I've provided them in the outline. Uh, next, I will speak about the connection of the spiritual life and wisdom, and why it's necessary for us to seek it. And lastly, I'll, I'll finish with some practical ways to become wise. What is wisdom? I think it's a given that almost everyone has a firm grasp of at least a part of what wisdom is and what it means to be wise. We all want to varying degrees, implicitly and explicitly, to be wise. And I think it would be, uh, be good to provide a brief survey of the different pursuits of wisdom in the ancient and medieval uh, worlds, because I've mentioned it so much, uh, just so as to see the consensus of, achieved by these traditions. The first people in the West who reflected deeply on this desire were the Greeks. They were the ones who first coined the term philosophy. And as many of you know, the word philosophy in Greek just means the love of, or you could even say the friend of wisdom. Philos, mean love or friend. These philosophers knew how true the words of Aristotle are when he says, all men desire by nature to know. Their natural approach was to ask for the why behind things. And this meant asking for what the causes of things are, were. The most, foundation, most famous formulation of causality out of the Greek tradition, which is taken up wholesale by St. Thomas and uh, many theologians in the church, uh, is the explanation of the four causes according to Aristotle. So these four causes are the formal, efficient, material, and final causes of a thing. Um, and this allows one true access to the, to the knowledge of this thing, um, to its most intimate aspects, um, to the things that are most universal about it, the most, in a sense you could say, the most true and, and eternal about it. So for example, the four causes of a human being are uh, the soul as the whole part, uh, the material as the body, uh, the body, uh, efficient God and our, our parents bringing us into existence. Uh, but also the final cause, to know and love God. So we're created for an end, for, to, to do something. Um, the church has actually defined that human bodies, uh, humans are bodies informed by souls. So this is actually, some of these things are part of it. Church doctrine. The people who attained this kind of knowledge were considered the wise ones. <laughs> they were the ones who could see the eternal reasoning behind things and how they were all interconnected on different levels within the grand scheme of reality. These ancients were the ones who really championed the off sided phrase, sapientis est ordinare, or it belongs to the wise to order. The way the Greeks gained this wisdom was through metaphysics, which as you might know is the study of being, because being is the most common thing in all the universe. To learn how and why and by what or whom things exist was to really understand life, the cosmos, and oneself. One was able to continually to gain a new perspective on things, and the etymology of the word perspective speaks of a new vision. This culture is present for the most part on the onset of the Christian dispensation. So you have, in a way, a Gentilic and a Hellenistic culture, uh, or Hellenic culture, that was primed to receive the gospel in order to supernaturalize their wisdom. These people, the Greeks, are uh, wisdom seekers, and the gospel is, the gospel is about wisdom, the wisdom of God. Eventually, by the medieval time, Greek philosophy is taken up by Christian thinkers. So we have here a continuity between classical and pagan understanding of wisdom, on one hand, and the medieval and Christian understanding of this virtue. This gives us a little background to the way in which wisdom has been sought. So working out of this framework of Christian wisdom, especially in the thought of sacred scripture and Aquinas, uh, one of my professors, James Brent, uh, Father James Brent, uh, kind of proposed a, a, a definition for wisdom. And he says, wisdom is a glimpse of the first principle of all things and an all-embracing understanding of reality as a whole in light of the first principle, especially in the light of the goal or purpose of it all. So I know that's kind of long, so I'll say it again. Wisdom is a glimpse of the first principle of all things. So we could even say that is God. And an all-embracing understanding of reality as a whole in the light of the first principle of God, especially in light of the goal or purpose of it all. So. God's point of view, of him kind of creating things and bringing them all back to himself. This first, uh, as I said, this first principle is understood by all in the Christian tradition to be God. Uh, so God is a supreme being who is the very act of existing itself. itself. 
brought forth creation in an ordered way according to his infinite wisdom, so that things may ultimately come to share in his infinite goodness. This plan of creation is coming forth, this wisdom, all culminates in him who is wisdom, Jesus. Does St. Paul not say in Colossians that in him all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden? We'll return back to this identification of Jesus with wisdom here. So the two forms of wisdom in, in three different modes. So wisdom can be concerned with two things, contemplation and action. When there is knowledge concern, uh, concerning contemplation, it is speculative wisdom. This means there is knowledge of things for their own sake. When it is concerned with action, this is practical wisdom. And they are both uh, intellectual, intellectual virtues. Specul speculative wisdom is usually called wisdom, and practical wisdom is, usually, is identified with prudence the chief cardinal and moral virtue, which directs us to act well. These two forms of wisdom are surely connected, and for us to see them that way is important. There's been much ink spilled over the, the relationship between those two, so it's, it's key to see them as unified. Uh, so St. Thomas, uh, when commenting on the gift of wisdom, notes, the higher a virtue is, the greater the number of things to which it, it extends. Wherefore, from the very fact that wisdom as a gift is more excellent than wisdom as an intellectual virtue, since it attains to God more intimately by a kind of union of the soul with Him, it is able to direct us not only in contemplation, but also in action. There's kind of like an overflow of kind of the density of, of, of truth and goodness in uh, the more uh, speculative uh, things, like um, the things we find in kind of the, uh, the, the deposit of faith, so like, you know, God is a triune God, and, and so this means so much more than just that statement. So the three types of wisdom. Now the Western intellectual tradition normally tests the three types of wisdom, natural or philosophical, and then theological and mystical. So an example uh, for natural is the ancient Greek philosopher. These philosophers employed the reason without the aid of supernatural grace to arrive at the understanding of the cosmos and nature. So they were able to achieve real results, to retain real fundamental truth, and thus wisdom. And, uh, everyone has this ability. We do this all the time uh, when, we, when we think about things and kind of come to a, an understanding of, of, you know, of human nature. This, this always happens, you know, for humans, or humans always do this. Uh, theological wisdom is the wisdom arrived at by using revelation for the principles of a new kind of science, so theology. It takes God as known through the deposit of faith and comes to know more about Him as first principle and the effects of His working through creation. This is simply what is happening in theology. An example of wisdom achieved in this type is that rather than just calling God the first principle of all things, as we do in philosophical wisdom, by revelation we can call God the principle of all things and loving and merciful Father, because that's what Scripture and the Church and in Scripture and tradition told us. <coughs> and he, we can also say, uh, he is uh, in, he, in knowing himself begets the person of the word, Jesus. And the love of this word and the word's love of him is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So we all have, all Christians have this ability by the grace of faith, the infused virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The other side of receiving these graces though leads us, leads to the reception of the third type of wisdom, mystical wisdom. St. Thomas tells us that the reception of the aforementioned graces of faith and such are accompanied by experiential knowledge of God. Father Brent says, furthermore, among the many endowments of the whole supernatural organism born from grace, so a baptized Christian, the Spirit's gift of wisdom holds a special and privileged place. For when the Spirit blows through the gift of wisdom, one knows God through connaturality with him. Experiential, experientially through love. So common naturality is kind of just this innate uh, knowledge. So that's what grace provides. So when you pray and you, you uh, receive things through prayer, uh, or you communicate with God simply, that's, there's this common natural knowledge, the knowledge of friends. So this love knowledge uh, of God is essentially, uh, of God essentially is a mystical union with him. This experience of God can also be understood as the presence of God. I liken the experience of mystical wisdom achieved with the gift of wisdom, kind of to receiving kind of backstage pass 
or backstage access to the drama of reality and creation, where one speaks with, with the director who is God, while still being caught up in the dynamism of, of life. I will return back to this mystical wisdom later. Okay, so number two. Why pursue wisdom? Because of holiness, to put it very simply. The, the saints are all wise. I assume all of you here want to be holy. Holiness is nothing other than knowing and loving God. And St. Thomas reminds us that we cannot love what we do not know. In the human mind, knowing and loving are uh, kind of, in a, sense, in a sense, two sides of the same coin. They happen together. As I just mentioned, wisdom seeking was a common practice in much of the church's history, and, is still in, and it still is today in many parts. This is largely what it means to love, to be caught up in the unifying spiral that is the knowing and loving of God. We must renew the vision of holiness to include wisdom seeking, because it used to be such a central part of what it means to pursue holiness and for right reason. For example, the greatest thing we can do is love God, but this act of loving God, the theological virtue of charity, by which we love God, is only perfected by receiving the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of wisdom. But let's not get ahead of ourselves right now. So we must talk about love in order to understand the pursuit of wisdom. In loving, we seek union with the object loved. That is the end of love, to rest in the beloved as one. And the love of God, or charity, in the eyes of Aquinas, is simply friendship with him. So it's very easy for him to have said that was kind of, it's very theologically dense for him, but what's beautiful is it's very relatable for all of us. We all have friends in a different modes. So St. Thomas articulates a great range in the levels of the poor of love, but we'll just speak here of love between humans and God. When we love, we move towards real union with people, and Aquinas says this is what friendship is. And friendship has five essential characteristics. So mutually known benevolence, so willing good to the person. Mutually known benevolence, uh, yes. oh, in a different type of mutually known benevolence, so this is willing something good to the person. Uh, beneficence, so actually doing something good uh, for the person. And the fourth one is concord or like-mindedness, so being of the same will. Um, and delight is the last one, so delight comes from being in the friend's presence. This last characteristic is crucial in that it highlights the privilege that the grace of charity bestows on us, of God being present to us and we to Him. He comes to dwell in the soul, all three persons, as a church by way of Scripture teaches us. This is where all the other characteristics can be exercised, the characteristics of, of friendship. Aquinas tells us that this friendship is a, is a convivere, or a living together. He calls this a communicatio as well, which kind of corresponds to our English cognate, communication. What does this communication look like for our friendships with God? Well, it is prayer, and more specifically, contemplation by way of the Holy Spirit. St. Thomas says, this especially belongs to friendship, really to converse with the friend. It is there that God begins to share his secrets with his beloved, says Aquinas. This, among the many gifts God bestows on us, is the one through which God particularly desires to share with us his wisdom. He begins to show us the hidden parts of himself in a mystical way, as I described in love. This light of truth, though, is too much for us to handle. So it's kind of like looking directly into the sun. But you can't absorb um, all that he's kind of giving us. But this is the beauty of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. By the gift of wisdom, our capacity to receive wisdom is enlarged. We are able to receive the knowledge of God has to bestow on us and use it for growth in knowledge and love. As we noted above, this is what wisdom is for. With the power of the gift of wisdom, the Christian can do several things. He can then more deeply order all the powers of his soul and the other gifts of wisdom that the other gifts of wisdom have begun to perfect. So we become more integrated um, and you, you kind of reach a, a self-possession. Um, St. John Paul II spoke about this a lot in his pontificate, in his writings. Um, when you, you know, for example, when you realize you're really angry at someone, uh, you said, we can all say we kind of lose this, uh, control and, and, and a possession of ourselves. Um, 
and those who have possession of themselves are, are the virtuous, and that's what we strive to be. Um, so in this self-possession, uh, a person can then give them, themselves more deeply in love to God and to neighbor. The wise Christian begins to, oh, and this is, this is a, another thing, the wise Christian begins to unravel the deep order behind nature, as this is at the heart of wisdom. So we, be, we begin to understand reality in a deeper way that causes us to ask more questions, um, and to be, uh, yeah, more, more cautious of, I guess, uh, the way that the Lord desires for us to lead our lives. Uh, thirdly, with this understanding of the order and nature of the universe and the things within it, the person can then better join in God's providence. They see how things are returning to God and the means by which they do so. Uh, this person sees this most especially in his exercise of prudence, which, we, as we said, is practical wisdom. He more easily and smoothly acts as a prudent person who takes care and provides for himself and for those around him, as parents do. He foresees the needs of others because he begins to understand them in a new way. So there's always kind of a renewal of our knowledge. Our, our knowledge of things isn't really stagnant. We, we usually end up learning a lot more about the different facets of, of different things. Um, lastly, we become better friends of God. The sacred author of wisdom tells us in chapter 7 and verse 27, Though she is but one, that is wisdom, she can do all things, and while remaining in herself, she renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God. He also says this earlier in verse 14 of the same chapter. So here we are drawn back to the reciprocity of love and wisdom. The better friends we become with Christ, the more we converse with Him in the depths of our soul. But not only He dwells, the help dwells there, the Father and Spirit also dwell there, and they increase and assimilate our image of God to theirs. This image, as St. Augustine put it, is none other than the human ability to conceive of a word. So he kind of, St. Augustine uses this analogy that that is the image of God in us, it's the fact that we can conceive of a word and then love that word, to, to like love the knowledge that we have, which is kind of like the, the God the Father's conceiving of, of the Son, uh, or begetting the Son, um, and loving Him. So that's kind of the aspiration of love in, in the Trinity. And so this increases our participation in wisdom, uh, or in their wisdom, is, is to receive that grace and become uh, particip participators in the life of the Trinity. So, more specifically, how does this gift of wisdom work? It works by God giving us knowledge that is connatural to us. So we talked about that earlier. We make judgments of things by this knowledge, by, uh, by inclinations. So kind of, uh, as I spoke, the, the innate knowledge that we kind of act off of. Um, once again, I guess, yeah, innately. This knowledge or wisdom is one with our nature, hence connatural. So we just experience or sense the truth of something like the Articles of Faith. Um, we've all learned these things from, you know, at such a young age. So in a sense, uh, what's beautiful is that as you grow older, you can kind of, you live your life accordingly to these principles of faith, the Articles of Faith. Um, and so, perhaps a more relatable word than connatural is what Father Brent calls love gazing. It is like doing theology by speaking directly with God in the depths of our soul. This is the use of the word to know in the biblical sense. It's intimate. Another way to see the dynamism in, in the way that the medievals, and especially biblical authors, view wisdom, is to look at the word sapientia, which, is, which means a wisdom in Latin. So the word sapere, which is the root of sapientia, means uh, to taste. So there's a, there's a deep, kind of uh, very personal aspect of of wisdom, and you can see this in, in other languages. So, in, in Spanish, it's the same. Uh, the word saber is uh, the word to know, but it also means to taste. It's the exact same word. So, knowledge has this kind of, uh, once again, more intimate, uh, experiential, kind of real life uh, experience, and not this uh, kind of lofty, uh, overly intellectual uh, kind of approach. Um, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, in his famous commentary on the Song of Songs, went so far as to speak uh, of the mystical kiss on the lips of Jesus, who is the word, the wisdom of the Father. 
because the opening line of the Song of Songs says, Oh, that you would kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. So it just speaks of the intimacy of, of, of words, words that we produce, um, the word who is Jesus. Um, and also, this is how an uneducated young nun like St. Therese of Lisieux can become a doctor of the church. It is what Jesus talks about when he says the Spirit will come and lead us into all truth. The truth about God, others, the world, sciences, ourselves, and the working of our interior lives. The gift of wisdom makes us more open to the Spirit's free and elegant gusts of inspiration. This is a life of freedom in the Spirit. To choose the virtuous and loving thing rather than the dull and or sinful thing. So lastly, how do we become wiser? This is the third point. Well, first, first off, you already are wise. God so wanted you to share in his wisdom that wisdom himself became you. He became human so that you might fully become fully imbued with, with wisdom. By virtue of your baptism, you have been given sanctifying grace, along with the theological virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, such as the gift of wisdom uh, mentioned earlier. The Catechism notes in 1216, having received in baptism the word, the true light that enlightens every man, the person baptized has been enlightened. He becomes a son of light. Indeed, he becomes light himself. We are further strengthened in this light in our confirmation. Becoming wise first happens by coming to God with filial fear and prayer, in the raising of our minds and hearts to God, the font of all wisdom. Scripture teaches us this in many places, when it reminds us that fear of the Lord is the first stage of wisdom. We see this in the Psalms all over the place. So we come humbly before our God in prayer, asking Him to grant us wisdom, first in order to know and love Him better. Another way is reading Scripture. So Lexio Divina, the church's uh, long honored tradition of, of prayerfully reading Scripture uh, over and over again. This is where the Word imbues you with His living Word and continues to teach you in all things. So we can check out the wisdom literature of, of, the, of the Scriptures. So, wisdom, Sirach, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Song of Songs, Job. There's plenty of this, for, uh, plenty of literature for us in Scripture to read about this. Um, another way is also uh, to ask Mary, uh, whose feast we celebrate today. Um, she is traditionally known as a Seda Sapiensi, or the seat of wisdom. Um, her humble wisdom is something we can always draw from. Another, another way um, is uh, asking your friends. So, uh, simply, how have you been seeking wisdom lately? That could be a, a question you ask with some of your more, some of your closer friends, those with whom you um, come to mass with, or um, your spouse or your children. Um, the pursuit of wisdom is a communal project, and that must be remembered. Um, we're always, we always need to be reminded that we're part of the body of Christ. Um, we're not just kind of on this individual pursuit. Of salvation. Um, so often, you know, I, I experience this. Often, often, great conversations start up among the brethren um, just by asking someone um, what they're reading. Um, and speaking of this communal project, it was suggested to me by Father Brent again that conversing with people about wisdom is preferable to just starting out with the word truth. Um, as many people know in today's world, it, it's uh, it's offensive even just to say the word truth to people. Um, and it is, it was, this is very, uh, this is particularly enlightening for me. Um, he said there's something particularly disarming about the word uh, wisdom versus truth, though they are synonymous in a lot of ways. Uh, it seems more mystical and thus more noble. It has the connotation that no one fully possesses it. So you might encourage people to seek wisdom uh, in this way so as to uh, provide a, a greater starting point for conversation. With, especially with those with whom you don't agree uh, on things. Um, another way is to seek it in theology, philosophy, and the sciences. Um, the church has an incredibly beautiful intellectual tradition that is ours to mine. Uh, we all seek it differently, of course, in different ways. But um, And we won't all be academics, but we must strive to seek wisdom in, in all its many forms. Uh, the church's lit liturgy is also supposed to be a catechetical experience as well. Um, might I advise you to spot out references to wisdom in the church's prayers? Uh, 
when we are celebrating that supreme act of worship. Uh, like in the collect, I have a, or in the handout, I have a, a collect from one of the masses in Advent. It speaks of uh, our growing in wisdom. Um, I remind you too that gaining much knowledge is not terrible, of course. I think I might have insinuated that at the beginning. Um, a treasure house of knowledge is the material by which we come to attain uh, wisdom and the wise ordering of things. Uh, I think that there, uh, I think at times there can be an anti-intellectualism that pervades the church. But this shouldn't be. Theology and sanctity should never be separated, as I hope to show in a small way tonight. But that is really a whole other issue. The accumulation of knowledge just needs to be seen in the right light, kind of in an architectonic framework of wisdom. And lastly, I would rec really recommend you to consider more distance uh, from those things that distract you, uh, external stimuli. It is well known in the Christian tradition that silence, rest, and peacefulness um, are highly conducive to prayer and contemplation. I see this in our life as a religious, it's kind of how we're structured. Uh, one is simply able to think more deeply about the things that matter. You are able to really drink in the wisdom of the saints and of the many things Christ wants to teach us. I truly believe we're always given more grace than we can imagine. Kind of like the analogy I made with the light earlier. We're always given more than, than we can kind of perceive. So the more attentive we are to God's working in our souls, the more we will be able to give over, be given over to the life of wisdom. There was a book uh, two years ago by Cardinal Seurat. And it was, it sounds, uh, I think, I think simply silence. And that was um, fascinating for me to read. And it, it really changed my perspective on how um, I go about my own study and, and just my own pri private alone time, which can, in our world, is kind of uh, scary. We don't like to be alone with nothing to do. Um, so I'll end, up, I'll end this lecture with a, a summary. We have seen that wisdom is the contemplation of the highest causes, especially of the highest cause, God. We contemplate God in our friendship with Him, and this helps us to grow in that friendship as do the gifts of grace and the Holy Spirit with the gift of wisdom. God gives us many ways to dynamically grow in wisdom, and in that way we can better grow in our understanding of reality and in self-governance, so as to know more fully how to love Him above all things. So I end by calling upon the wisdom and imitation of the sacred author of the Book of Wisdom. Send her forth from the holy heavens, and from the glory of your, from the throne of your glory, send her, that she may labor at my side, and that I may learn what is pleasing to you. For she knows and understands all things, and she will guide me wisely in my actions and guard me with her glory. Then my works will be acceptable, and I shall judge thy people justly and shall be worthy of the throne of my Father. Thank you. So that might be, a, I'd say, a short call, um, or the yeah, enemy of, of uh, kind of this narrow outlook, uh, rather than asking the questions that deal with all the aspects of our life or uh, the related uh, parts of that said science. Um, but the way it might be a difference is, I think, is uh, as an analogy or um, um, kind of a, uh, yeah, to, to, to draw one into um, the, the, the majestic kind of ordering of things. I think, I think it's it's always um, impressive when we see things like this, like yeah, the data sheet um, that someone might propose, or Brother James loves Excel sheets and he likes flex or, or things like that. So I'm often amazed at how we can do these things very quickly. And um, as, as Scripture tells us, as the theologians tell us, um, the natural uh, natural ordering of the world leads us to God. Saint Paul talking about. But, I mean, the, the integrative triumphs of contemporary theoretical physics uh, really also lead people mm -hmm. to the contemplation of God. Why don't they? Well, it seems, actually, the most recently I spoke with Father Thomas Davenport. So there's a priest of the province who uh, received his PhD in physics at, uh, at, at Stanford. And so he's, he's really integrated this with his uh, 
his priestly work. And he says we're getting, we're actually becoming like more and more uncertain about the, the deeper, even farther, you know, levels of reality. You know, we used to talk about quantum mechanics, and now they're just getting things that they can't even, you know, understand at deeper and deeper levels. And so we're kind of disarmed uh, of, of, of being so sure of, of what we can achieve by, by science. And he's saying that uh, this is, yeah, it, we, we're not even anywhere near done finding out the, the foundational physical parts of the universe. And I thought, I thought I found that fascinating because most of us, I think we go through school and we, we learn, oh, okay, scientists have it all figured out. You know, uh, Einstein came and, and did it all. Um, but, uh, so yeah. Question? Oh. Um, earlier you mentioned Five points of friendship. Could you repeat the, the second and third one? Like, yes. Um, oh, so um, the second one was mutually known but benevolence. Um, so willing something good to the person. So we can will, we can will, um, just will good to the person. Something. For a person, so like, if I were to give you something. And the third one uh, was beneficence. So actually, uh, well, sorry, not that beneficence is, not, is if I actually gave something to you. But if I wish something well to you, that would be the same. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Pray that good things would happen to you, or various things that the friends do and think for each other. Uh, this is uh, on page 11, when you turn your paper over, mm -hmm. uh, related wisdom about folks. Uh, going down to number five, it says, the higher the virtue, the greater number of things in which it extends. Wherefore, the very fact that wisdom as a gift is more excellent than wisdom of an intellectual virtue. My question is, would you consider wisdom to be closer to the intellect or closer to judgment? Or both. Um, so uh, traditionally, the uh, philosophers and theologians have, uh, think of three judgment, three three acts of the intellect. So judgment would fall into an act of the intellect. Okay. So we first uh, apprehend things. So I apprehend just that what that thing that's a chair uh, and then make a judgment uh, about it, and then I uh, act judgment. Reason, you know, reason, uh, yeah. So, um, so in a way, wisdom helps us to do those, to do those things uh, more quickly, I guess you could say, and, and uh, yeah, quickly and better and more accurately. Um, yeah. Would we say then the higher the wisdom of man, the closer as he becomes closer to God? Mm -hmm the better off he is because of he has the wisdom to detect what the real truth is about everything. Yeah, exactly. I would say yeah, that's yeah, a very good way of putting it. St. Thomas uh, and other people say that this kind of an axiom of um, saying slight matters in, 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 in principles leads to great uh, errors in, in uh, conclusions. So when you're reasoning about things, so the more certain you are about the principles, the better you will reason um, in speculative matters that I mentioned, but also in practical matters. So about you know every action you do every day. Um, so that's I think that's reassuring, especially for Christians. And we're, we're we're often uh, kind of paralyzed <laughs> by our, our actions, not knowing how to act. It, it can be confusing. You know, there's so many variables to take into account, and the more principles we we have and know uh, and can quickly access. And that's that's what wisdom does, which is really beautiful. That you can you can especially when there are different virtues that are in prudence. And if you can kind of take a, take account of all those more quickly, then you make better actions. Or you do better actions. So yeah. So if the first
first step of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Do you have a second step? I'm not a problem. I have a What scripture does it? I think it's talking about it. But I wish, I wish maybe it, it did, but uh, maybe you can figure that out. <laughs> I don't think St. Thomas, I, I haven't seen much about it in either St. Thomas or uh, other things. So. Yeah. Is the second step, according to St. Thomas, the love of truth? I don't know. I don't know. And they have to fear the Lord, love of truth. God the, the eternal. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I, I, I haven't. I mean, the whole business of going to fear the love, that's what Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. The twelve step programs, like Gamblers Anonymous or mm -hmm. Readers Anonymous, which are all based on the twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of them is uh, to <clears throat> improve your conscious contact with God. And then there's in addition to the twelve steps, there's the twelve promises. And one of them is that um, we will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. And um, I think that sounds like um, mystical wisdom, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, especially with uh, the power of grace, especially in those type of situations. I, I know a little bit about uh, friends that were yeah, in AA, for example. Um, yeah, and so the, the beautiful thing, especially with, let's say, prudence, um, the more prudent we become in by God's grace and, um, and um, by our actions, um, the more not only it forms our intellect but also our will. So our will is more uh, uh, firmly aligned with what is good. Uh, but the more, the better we can apprehend and distinguish, discern what is good, uh, especially uh, in say tricky situations. Uh, the quicker we can make the better decisions and not kind of waffle. Um, that's often, I think, where uh, unfortunately the enemy gets us is when we kind of, once again, like I mentioned earlier, paralyzed because we're not sure about things. Uh, and not that any of them will ever get it right in this world, but uh, that's, that's, that's the beauty of grace and, and asking the Spirit to come uh, and bestow the gift or to increase in us the gift of wisdom. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, it's more holistic. Rightly ordering our appetites, the things that we desire. Um, but, uh, but often those things become fairly complicated, so um, you'd have to go in more in depth with, people, with specific uh, um, situations with different uh, addicts. Yes, sir. And to some extent, um, wouldn't that be? Not necessarily intuitive, but um, almost you, know, you might almost call it by an inductive process. That you, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of, for instance, the wisdom, a lot of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It often strikes me that it's a result of uh, somebody who's seeing a lot of things, he's seen various situations, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what he's basing his wisdom on. The word test, maybe you heard one of those situations. Mm -hmm. one of the It's almost like an inductive process. You're looking at particular situations, particular facts, and then drawing, drawing a conclusion from that. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, this might happen this time, and this time, and this time, and that this is what you should do in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I agree. Uh, the, the thing, I guess, that first comes to mind is that grace kind of assures us more deeply of those conclusions that we arrive at. Because yeah, a lot of inductive uh, reasoning um, can kind of be limited, and so if you have a limited number of experiences, you might not know that. Uh, say like, yeah, you've only seen ten people do this thing, but you you can automatically assume it's like human nature. Uh, it's inherent to human nature to do that thing. Then, um, but but then you don't see anyone else do it. Like you don't really know uh, unless you then deductively came from the principles of like, you know, philosophical 
argument, but that the gift of, of wisdom and you know, mystical wisdom is, as I said, uh, it's really cool that St. Thomas speaks of like friends love to share secrets with each other. So in prayer, or even with the, um, in scripture, you could see like, well, this is uh, that particular uh, inductive you know, conclusion. Um, I know by grace, you know, which is a tricky thing to say, but to know it, to know that that is true, you know, that that, that is a true statement. Um, I'm not sure if that's making sense, but it, it bolsters us more deeply um, because um, there are many scripture practices that talk about it. grace brings truth to knowledge, and that's very good. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that does that help you. Sure, I'm, I'm just. I just thought, of, um, I mean, it strikes me that the whole, the whole notion of wisdom is kind of like it's very multifaceted. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and in some cases, it's, um, it's even more about the process of it um, than, uh, I mean, if you look at, you know, like the Socratic or the Platonic dialogue of Socrates, it's, um, it's almost like it's a search that's going on and never quite quite ends, mm -hmm. more and more, but then the process of learning an awful lot of things you still don't know. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's the kind of, the beauty of, uh, of Christian theology is that God has given us this revelation, and it's, it's closed, but in a, in a sense it's, in a sense it's not, because we continue to develop it more deeply. And the, the beauty of the saints is that they show us things that most of us would not be able to arrive at because of Scripture. But it's it's there, but it, it's uh, it's something that's not explicit, you know. Um, they're just yeah, the, the utter depths of God and, and 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 the truth, like the density of truth, you might say, in the deposit of faith. You spoke about it a little bit at the beginning, but I might you be able to draw a distinction for us between <clears throat> wisdom and knowledge, and whether knowing a lot of things makes one wise. Like if we say an encyclopedia. Or like Google or the internet is, is wise, or, or just <laughs> like a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess in a, in a sense you could say yeah, having a lot of knowledge. I, yeah, I did speak about it a little bit. Um, I guess I've, I've seen it as uh, accumulating knowledge can be the basis by which we become wise. Um, and uh, this the scholastic philosophers, as I mentioned, uh, they were very famous for distinctions, right? So. The way they related all this knowledge um, to different pieces of knowledge they had was, I mean, it's the great triumph of, of St. Thomas Assume was to, to kind of look at the entire entirety of reality and say, see how everything fits. Um, and so, uh, and you could say that that, um, that someone's wise in that sense, but because that knowledge will not be other than private connections to other things. Um, but I, I would say for many people was a far cry from um, true wisdom, especially in the maybe biblical or mystical sense, as we go up from you know, natural to theological to mystical, um, because there's no final cause in it. And, um, it's, yeah, it's kind of it's a utility to, to maybe attain a lot of knowledge. Um, and as we see, I mean, maybe there are many people who are great scholars, but they don't necessarily pursue their study, as I said, in a wise way. And, you know, and, and we would say as Christians that, um, like I said, since the scripture talks about wisdom, that only the true, truly wise are the ones that fear God, as it says. So if you're that far from, from knowing and loving God, then you must, um, there must be something fairly um, perverted about your sense of wisdom. Smart, 
and uh, I, I, I found it in myself that as <coughs> the years have gone by, I'm, I no longer make mistakes as a young person out of ignorance, but I make a lot of assumptions that turn out to be wrong. And uh, that's, that's an event, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, many of us are quick to act once again, and so, um, as I spoke earlier, uh, knowing how to act quickly but correctly is, is a great challenge. Um, and, at what, and, and how and at what times and in what ways. Um, so, as someone spoke the wisdom of being very kind of multifaceted thing. Um, and the, the more, once again, you think about it, the more it, it actually is kind of overwhelming that there are so many things to consider. It's like, as you said, uh, growing older, there are things, there are certain mistakes you don't make. But in a sense, we almost develop new, new vices or new struggles uh, because there are things we never considered. Uh, especially, you know, every year that we grow older, there are different things we never considered. Um, so. Well, I, I hate to keep you but uh, could you expand a bit on what uh, you and Aristotle want to say, Thomas mean by prudence? Because uh, Machiavelli, if I remember rightly, says, if there be anything more to prudence than strategy and careful tactic, I know it not. What? <laughs> yes. And I suspect most people, when they hear the word prudence, think of that as a prudence. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess the first thing yeah, that comes to mind is uh, what he thinks, what he's thinking about in, with prudence is with respect to you know, uh, method, maybe, um, of just operating in a, in, a, in a way that allows you to achieve any goal. That, that maximizes your desired goal. Yeah, any goal. That, and I guess this is the distinction is the prudent man that wants, mm -hmm. yeah, so does the tradition of St. Thomas and Aristotle would say that the object of your desire orders the entire way in which you pursue that um, that object. Um, it orders the act and describes the act that you're, you're pursuing, you do in order to pursue that thing. So um, these you know, these philosophers would say that the good is the only thing that the prudent man the only the prudent man only pursues the good really. Um, and um, yeah, there's a, there are lacking I guess virtues. If one pursues, you know, an evil um, and he goes about it wisely or prudently, um, then it's the whole the whole project is uh, kind of at a loss because uh, because of, once again the the object of pursuing is not something that will then perfect you as a person and lead you to your own goal. Is that yeah, good to put it? Yeah. Tough question. <laughs> I was just thinking that in the class of you as a prudence, a matter of uh, weighing, uh, being aware of and weighing all of the virtues uh, in a situation. And it's not simply a matter of deciding what's the best way to do it to your adversaries, which is just simply ignoring all the virtues that um, may possibly come into play in the situation. Yeah, you well, you're classically. Um, the four cardinal virtues, prudence would be the, the kind of organizer of the right. world. And so if if it's organized with temperance, but temperance is if you are going to be a temperate person, um, then uh, then the project is somewhat failed already. Um, and uh, once again, if you're pursuing the evil, um, then uh, yeah, in a sense, pr prudence of that world is. Hey, I'm just speculating here. Prudence wouldn't know how to direct temperance, maybe in one sense, because it's uh, that that virtue um, would be just um, hindering the person from, from operating uh, correctly. I guess. So yeah. For, so for instance, uh, if someone is not temperate in their eating, uh, and he's just completely, they're completely overwhelmed by the food they just ate. Then they can't really go about thinking correctly on how to then uh, 
say, write their paper or, or things like that because they can't even think about the vet because they hurt. So, um, so maybe, maybe that's all. I thought it was excellent.